The Southern African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, also known as SIEM, was established over 125 years ago to facilitate the sharing of knowledge between members and to represent professionalism, innovation and technical excellence in our minerals industry. The industry has been experiencing reduced outputs, increasing costs and volatile markets. It is operating in an environment impacted by the fourth industrial revolution, globalization and continuously changing societal views on climate change, clean energy imperatives and increasing environmental, social and governance requirements. Innovation, technical excellence and the development of professionals with new knowledge and skills are a national and global imperative if the industry is to remain productive and competitive in today's world. SAIM is responding by expanding its sphere of influence, both geographically and in terms of benefits to members, the mining industry and our broader society. This will make it easier to contribute to good corporate citizenship and transformative social investment. These are imperatives that require multi-stakeholder dialogue through platforms that the Institute can offer as an independent professional body. SAIM is able to showcase technical innovation, research and development. It creates platforms to solve industry problems, disseminate knowledge and provides opportunities for continuous professional development of our members. The Institute contributes to professional standards for the minerals industry in Southern Africa and the world through our global reach and alliances. SAIM is reaching out to new professionals and new organizations to grow with the times. We are particularly interested in creating partnerships that can deliver quantifiable benefits to both companies and their employees. This could involve tailor-made membership packages for employees and company-specific offerings. SAIM, the leading professional institute for the Southern African minerals industry. Good day, I'm Steve Ruprecht, um, I'll be presenting the course today, just get the presentation up, I'm, I'm not sharing my, uh, my picture due to um, concerns with um, web uh, issues, I'm in Papua New Guinea, um, I'll just give you oops, sorry sorry somehow I've actually put up the third session um, but <clears throat> we're hoping that uh, the the intro uh, the um, how would you say the uh, in, uh, the Wi-Fi will hold out we won't have problems with it I'll just get to the right uh, slide there we go all right, so today or this afternoon, this evening, I'll be presenting on the SAMRA code and SAMBAL code. Um, that's me. Um, I'm a mining engineer with over 36 years experience. Um, I'm a professor at the University of South Africa, um, of South Africa, Johannesburg, University of Johannesburg. I'm an honorary uh, lifetime member of the SIM Council, which you have seen um, and as you can see, I've done a lot of work in mineral reserve estimations and valuations, um, compilations of competent persons reports, NI 43101s. Uh, I've been doing that for uh, since about 2003. Um, I've been involved with um, the SAMREC committee in various uh, ways since 2010. And yeah, so. For the next uh, couple of hours, the idea is just to share, uh, uh, an, you know, the basics of, uh, of the SAMREC reporting code, the SAMVAL uh, reporting code. I'll briefly make a few comments about our, our guidelines in terms of um, uh, SAMES, which is environmental, social and government issues, which is one of those currently hot, hot topics. and. Um, 
you know, the the, the SAMREC committees are, are looking at how we, you know, improve the, the reporting of environmental, social and government issues. Uh, and so continuing to look at the at the guidelines. So I'll make a few comments about that as we continue. Okay, to start off, uh, start off with the background of, you know, where the codes have come from, why they've come. Um, if we go back, um, and I think one would understand that there's been um, fraud and and in the mining industry, even way back in the gold gold rush of uh, of California and the silver mines of of Nevada, and you know throughout the world there has been um, concerns about uh, you know, that uh, you know people are being uh, encountering fraud, um, and even back in the fourteen uh, hundreds. Uh, comments were made that, uh, you know, buyer beware and you must test uh, the, the ground before buying it and, and things like that. But if we move to modern time background, the Poseidon Nickel in, in 1969 in, um, in Australia, um, Western Australia, there was a, a, a company, um, Poseidon Nickel, that, uh, as you can see on the right hand side, it, it started and, and uh, uh, was listed and people invested on it, and you can see that the, the shares uh, started at 80 cents uh, to the Australian dollar, went up as high as $280. So from basically $1 to $280 at its peak, and, and in February 1970, that's you know it reached that uh, when it started production. But as soon as it started production, it started to run into problems. Um, the ex extraction costs were higher than expected. And, you know, the grade much lower than originally thought. Um, and the problem there was the original grade estimations were based on very limited sampling. By 1975, you know, things started getting worse. Uh, the, the nickel price fell significantly um, uh, due to um, the Vietnam War ending. And... Uh, um, and by 1976, uh, it basically delisted due to in insufficient uh, profits. And obviously, quite a few people um, lost a lot of money. So this really started where the Australians started look, you know, uh, looking at the reasons behind this. And they created the, you know, they, a lot of talk and, uh, and concerns were raised in, in 18, uh, 1989. The Joint Ore Reserve Committee, the JOR Committee, was formed um, um, in, you know, during that stage, and the code was published uh, in, sorry, I should say, in 1989, the JOR code was originally published. And that was the beginning of the, our international reporting codes. And the key thing, very much like the SAMRAC code, the JOR code, uh, was, is enforced by the ASX. If we move further ahead, um, we see in the 19, uh, 1990s, BRIEX came along, and a lot of us um, have heard about BRIEX. And, and the problem with BRIEX is, again, um, another uh, company that defrauded millions of, of dollars from the public. And one can see, you know, that, uh, that the David Walsh, uh, Ferdehoff, and uh, Michael de Guzman, who was the, the geologist on the site, um, in their various roles, um, took BRIEX and it just kept going higher and higher until um, there was a due diligence done. And basically, when they went to look for this high, uh, this supposedly very valuable deposit and it was being punted as being as big as the Vitvavastrand with the kind of gold that they were finding and the the ounces that they were announcing um i think they were talking about 39 million ounces of gold and it just kept going higher and higher um you know and uh, basically when uh, freeport mcmorran came in to do a due diligence they didn't find any gold and basically the, the share crashed uh, in 1997. And that really put a lot of emphasis on 
the mi mineral industry having to do something to ensure that the the comments and things raised um, by the ind by yeah the industry that they were true. Uh, if if the investors could not trust uh, what the exploration companies and mining companies were putting out there, uh, we were not going to get funding. So it really brought this development of of the codes. And you know, here we're talking about say the international codes. So you know, to take you a step through, you know, the Jork as we said, it started in really the committee started in seventy one. Uh, seventy five started the the demise uh, of Poseidon Nickel. In 1989, Jork Code is published, and we work our way you know, down to the SME and SAMREC formed in 1992, um, the Society of Mining Engineers of the United States. So around 92, 94, a lot of work is being done on it. Um, and by 1997, when the BREAC scandal you know, really starts becoming in the forefront, a lot of work and uh, effort was made to bring these co uh, these uh, codes together. Um, the Denver Code, Denver Accord was made in 1997, and basically that's where we said we would not be talking about possible reserves, and we started looking at our definitions of uh, resources. Excuse me, resources and reserves. So we can see in in 2000, which is after the BREAC scandal, but a lot of effort was put in um, to publish the, the, the SAMREC code. And I might add, you know, the code was already coming in before BREAC. Um, work was being done, but the BREAC scandal definitely uh, accelerated the process. And this continued on, and, you know, we've had rewrites. So, you know, in Later years, we 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 published uh, another the, um, other codes, and I'll show that just now. But in two thousand and eight, we brought in the Samval code. Um, in two four twenty fourteen, the Samog, which is for oil and gas, was written in South Africa for our oil and gas industry, and published in twenty fifteen, and in twenty sixteen. We, we basically started the, uh, the writing, the rewrite for the, the SAMREC code, um, the SAM codes. We updated them in 2016. And in SAM, uh, 2016, we al also published the SAMES uh, guideline. So that, like I say, is for the environmental, uh, social, and uh, government reporting as a guideline. And um, like I say, we are looking at updating it um, and um, making use of it more. Um, it's still, it's a guideline, it's not part of the code, but, um, you know, in terms of our competent persons reports, um, it, it's being implemented and in, in, um, uh, compiled with, with our CPRs. So along with the SAMREC and SAMVAL work, we often will bring in the Sam Eggs report. Okay. If we talk about Crisco, which Crisco is our our an over our our overreaching organization um, that looks after all the codes. It's a, an NGO. Um, so it represents all the organizations that are responsible for developing the, the mineral reporting codes and, and the guidelines for public public reporting purposes. Um, we meet annually and all the, as you can see on the map, um, there's 14 members, uh, each with their own national reporting code. And they meet on an annual basis uh, and look at um, issues and upcoming issues. They'll review the definitions. And for instance, uh, you know, we have a committee now involved looking at how we do, you know, reporting of environmental, social, and government issues, uh, and improving upon that. So you find that also we've got other countries coming into it um, over time. We've got China, Mozambique, Argentina, Bolivia, Philippines, Azerbaijan, uh, all in the pipeline of joining. Um, and you'll see that about 80% of the uh, listed companies worldwide will be reporting 
under one of these codes. Uh, so it's you know, quite important. Um, you'll, you'll see that if you look at Africa, you'll see you got South Africa down at the bottom and then very much of a, a, white, a white blob um, of, of countries that uh, n not having their own code, which uh, I probably would advocate in that what you find is that the companies that are operating um, generally will be Australian, uh, South African, um, Canadian and American companies. And you'll find that while working in the Ivory Coast or Ghana or, or wherever, um, <clears throat> they will be using one, generally one of the three codes, usually the, either the Canadian CIM or an NI43101 uh, code, or they'll use a SAMREC code, or they'll use a JORC. This ten, tends to be what you'll find that when you go out. So, for instance, uh, last month I was doing a due diligence in the DRC. The company is run by um, uh, an Indian uh, company, and they're reporting under the JORC code, for instance. So this is typically what you'll see. So it's not to say that each and every country needs its own uh, code. Um, and you'll see in general, the bigger codes tend to be um, used, like I say, as a three. Um, and probably important to highlight that if any of the company, companies are listed in the United States, um, they're responsible now to uh, report under um, what they call a TRS, a technical report summary, which also has a, a document similar to Crisco and has undertaken uh, a lot of Crisco's definitions, but um, also requirements required by the United States in reporting. And what the, that code is pushing, um, it's not a code, sorry, but that what that uh, requirement for the United States is um, a report, um, a technical report that talks in, in, in very much in, in plain English or simple English so that an investor who's maybe not a geologist or a mining engineer or metallurgist can, can understand the simple English. And it's really um, about providing information to the um, potential investor or investor, and even to the point where um, they may be asking you to over uh, provide more information than normal, uh, but uh, laying, uh, laying the foundation of providing good communication all for the benefit of the um, investor and to protect the investor from any fraudulent uh, activities or it's not always uh, fraudulent just you know perhaps uh, not abiding by the rules and doing things as well as one should so these things are put in place to ensure that we do our work proper um, and protect the investors that they're not losing money so if we go a little bit further on the background, an important uh, aspect um, of the of the code um, or the Crisco is that uh, we, over time, we've uh, the objective has been to standardize terminology and definitions internationally. And the key thing here is that we have fifteen standard definitions that no matter where I am in the world, you know, if we say what a public report is. A public report will mean the same no matter, you know, if you're in the United States or in Australia or in South Africa. And the same goes with the definition of a competent person. Um, we highlight that in, in North America, they, they use the term qualified person, but basically it's the same thing. Um, modifying factors, which you can see at the bottom of this table, um, you know, shows here mining, processing, metallurgical, uh, e economic, marketing, um, legal, environmental, uh, infrastructure, social and government. So that down there is, is what we would call the <coughs> um, modifying factors. We use that to, and we'll talk about it later, but we use that basically to convert uh, a resource to a reserve. 
Um, we talk about expiration targets and results. So when you, in the book, uh, under expiration results, we talk about what is an expiration target? What is an ex expiration results? And that'll mean the same. And then, you know, the definitions, mineral resource, the inferred indicated measured resource. What does that mean? What are those definition? And then we talk about mineral reserves, probable improved. And again, in North America, you'll sometimes see, uh, you'll see the word proven with an N instead of a D. Um, the NI-43-1 uses that. Uh, and it's one thing because of legal reasons in, in Canada to change that to prove which everybody else is using, um, very difficult. So you will see at times the term proven, uh, you'll know you're, you're usually dealing with the uh, CIM or the SME from the United States, uh, yeah. And then the basic, you know, definition as well. And, and it's important, uh, what is a scoping study that we, we understand what it is, what is a pre-feasibility study, and what is a feasibility study? Um, they have all the same, uh, um, same definitions. Uh, and again, in, in, in the North America market, instead of using the word scoping study, they will use the term PEA, Preliminary Economic Assessment. Um, but again, uh, meaning the same thing. And this becomes important uh, in that in order to declare a reserve, you have had to had, had to have done a at least a pre-feasibility study or a feasibility study. And a scoping study is not um, good enough, it's not uh, enough uh, confidence in the work to declare a reserve. But, uh, you know, one of the things we have seen is uh, people, uh, companies uh, have doing work to a scoping study level and declaring a mineral reserve. And so it's important that one understands, you know, what that is. And, each of the codes uh, will, you know, discuss, you know, what it is and explain it. So again, one can't say, I don't understand uh, our scoping studies different than yours. No, they're the same. Um, often it's just companies either misunderstanding the code or competent persons misunderstanding the code or to be honest, taking the chance and um, doing a declaring a reserve without having done enough uh, technical work. So, you know, if we talk about, you know, background and, and, and enforcement and how we, we make sure things are, are being used, um, obviously in South Africa it's driven by the JSC and like I say, the, the, the Americans um, have theirs, uh, the, the TRS report, uh, uh, for if a company is listed in the United States um, and Australia has the ASX. So <clears throat> we have in our listing rules, if, if we're putting out a, a new IPO, there's a competent persons report and under special conditions, uh, transactions, you might have to put in a, a, a new CPR. Um, otherwise, uh, we also have from uh, our listing point of view, um, our annual reports where under section 12 of the JSC, the certain rules on how we do ongoing reporting, um, you know, what we need to, t what we need to, to tell, uh, explain to the investor or potential investor. I think we'll talk about that a little bit more detail. The, the, the key thing as well, to be a competent person's person, um, you, miss, you must be with an organization or body that um, has a, um, uh, a code of ethics and a dis disciplinary committee. And the, and the key thing there is that one must be able to, if you have a, a problem or a complaint that you have a, uh, you know, a body to list your complaint and, and they can investigate it. So, you know, like if we talk about professional bodies, um, um, we can talk about EXA, uh, we can talk about a PR, PRSI, uh, we can also talk about uh, the SIMM, um, 
is another body that we you know we can complain to for reserves and GSS GSSA um, as well for for the resources for the geologists so it's important um, that there is that ability to to lodge a complaint um, um, and again we have a a policy in place that if I'm a member of the SIM, um, or the ASEAN, or SME, or the Canadian CIM, I can um, recognize professional organization. I could also be signing off on a CPR in South Africa, and we would recognize uh, that uh, that competent person from another country. We we have this. Uh, um, policy in place uh, that we, you know, we understand it. So in terms of, of, of the code and, and um, SAMREC code and all the international codes, you know, it's important that we have these definitions uh, that, uh, that we all understand that are, are, are sim not similar, are set for each of the, the countries. Um, and that, you know, investors can understand, accountants can understand, uh, you know, the, the terms being used, that we all understand them, and all the guide, all the codes un work under the principle of transparency. So, you know, whatever we do, we want people to see, um, clearly see how things have been done. Um, anything that's material should be reported upon, and obviously the work done should be competent. Um, and I can highlight perhaps now that right now both the Australians and the Canadians are are looking at this competency and and you know looking at the definition of a competent person in more detail because there's a bit of concern that people are writing the competent persons are writing reports and then on on projects and when the project comes to book they don't achieve anywhere near what the report or the feasibility study or pre-feasibility study set out. Now, one can argue some of this is um, the company as well, uh, an issue with the quality of work or the assumptions being used. But um, looking, you know, the, the Australians, the Canadians are looking at, you know, how much should the competent person be looking and ensuring that they've investigated enough to ensure that uh, that these assumptions aren't wrong, because again, people are using these reports to invest money, and um, you know, as you know, investors don't like losing money. Um, and I was, you know, we know that uh, sometimes when we're doing our uh, our feasibilities, our pre-feasibilities, sometimes we're a bit optimistic in in our uh, assumptions. Um, for different reasons, but again, it, it is something that's being looked at, and so we may see a little bit more um, uh, interest in what a competent person is and how you determine if you're competent in that in that field or not. Um, right now, it's up to you to defend whether you are competent with your peers. Um, but again, there might be a little bit more work on that um, coming or uh, emphasis placed on that because of the number of projects that are um, not achieving what they promised. <clears throat> so again, from a private investor's point of view, uh, many of these codes uh, become code-based documents are for investment. And there's basically there's some legal parts to it. So again, uh, when we work on TRSs, um, technical report summaries in the United States, um, there is a lot of onus on, on, on making sure that what you do report is correct because um, the United States is, uh, you know, they're fond of, of, of legal action and more so than most countries. It's kind of a, and, and so one has to be much aware of when you're reporting uh, in the United States that uh, one, you know, you're, you're doing your work correctly because you may be held to account uh, on a legal and financial point of view. Um, so beware of that. Um, we have other, you know, state permitting bodies. So often, you know, for our mining rights, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're supposed to have a pre-feasibility study level documentation. Um, done, which means, you know, we should be at the reserve basis. 
Um, we know that that doesn't always happen. Um, sometimes at scoping study levels, but again, if you haven't done the work correct, your permitting might be based on incorrect work and uh, you could find problems later on that uh, you said your stockpiles would be one size and, and now they're a lot larger and uh, it, you could run into problems with that. So it's important that the work that we do for other things like uh, mining rights and that the work that we do is good as well. I've talked about the annual reporting uh, uh, basis. Again, there are requirements and you have to uh, uh, use section 12 of the JSC to ensure that you report properly. Um, and we also then, we'll talk later, and we also use uh, valuations of our properties um, and, uh, you know, and has impacts in terms of royalty and taxes. If I look at the, the background um, to the, uh, to the, the, to the uh, SAMRAC uh, Standards Committee, the SSC, uh, it's important to know this is kind of the looks after the, the, the codes. Um, uh, it's re responsible for the administration, promotion, um, updates, management of the SAM codes. Um, it does, it's responsible for training. If there's complaints, it deals with the complaints. So this is the the, the body or the committee that will investigate the complaint uh, if one is raised, and it deals with the ROPO, um, you know, recognized professional organization, the reciprocity. Um, so we'll send a letter uh, to Canada, to Australia, and that that they represent. They will accept our are people, you know, myself as say a, uh, a member of the um, SIMM or, or, and, uh, and we will accept theirs as being a competent person. Um, again, the importance is that we all organizations have a disciplinary committee and ethics uh, standards. Um, the SSC, we send two, two representatives to Crisco every year, and we're part of the MVAL for the valuation to ensure that we're aligned from an international point of view. Um, and the funding of this comes through the GSSA and the SIMM, 50-50 um, basis, 50-50 uh, uh, point of view. and. You can see that we have 16 interested and affected parties um, with, you know, uh, attending the, the monthly meetings um, to ensure, you know, good compliance and to ensure, you know, that from legal point of view, survey point of view, that all parties, you know, are interested um, and infected parties have a, have a say. Um, if we go to the family of codes, um, I'm talking today, you know, uh, about SAMREC and SAMVAL. Uh, smog, uh, SAMOG is, uh, again, oil and gas. Um, so it, it's in our code family, but I won't be talking about it because it's for oil and gas. It's not really there um, in our domain. Uh, we have two sets of guidelines within the code. So we have the codes and then we have two guidelines. Um, so we have the SAMAS, um, like I said, environment, social and uh, government issues. Um, and we have the guidelines for reporting diamonds and gemstones. Um, and I, as I said uh, earlier, the, the ESG point of view is really a very uh, big topic now, the social license to operate. Uh, most of the codes worldwide are, are looking at this and how, we're, how they're going to um, improve or improve on the reporting of environmental, social and governmental issues. Um, although it's in table one, um, is to ensure that, you know, it, it, that the reporting improves upon it. Um, uh, there's a feeling that just reporting on um, table one of a few of the aspects is not enough. The guideline will go into more detail, give more, uh, uh, the investors more information than what is just required in the SAMREC code itself. Um, and so, um, again, um, there are guidelines to have uh, our reporting. 
and I don't cover it uh, in detail, but uh, it is on our, our website that if one wants to see it, and they, the, the SAMEX group, uh, gives uh, presentations on a regular basis as well. And then the, the, the final one is our SANS document, SAB standards for evaluating coal deposits. And so that um, recently, over the last few years, was rewritten and uh, addressed many of its shortcomings that was done early on. Um, and so that's out there um, um, to assist us uh, in the coal fields. Uh, I've kind of talked about the JSC already, but um, again, um, the SAMCOs from a rep a public reporting you know, both for the valuations and for um, SAMREC, um, we need to put these into our um, into our CPR. So the, the CPR must comply with SAMREC and SAMBEL codes. And as I said, often the codes now will include the SAM as, as a, a section as well. And key is that the executive summary um, should be uh, include a brief discussion of all the key modifying factors and all the key inputs uh, that one would require. There must be a, in, uh, include a section on risk and I kind of highlight these because some of these things are, are, are missed at times. And then at the back of the SAMREC, we, we have table one compliance. And it, the table one helps to ensure that as a competent person, um, that we see uh, what needs to report be reported on on a different levels in terms of resources and reserves, and we have these same tables in at the back of uh, the, the Sam the Samvel code. Um, again, highlighting these are the things we must talk about. And as of 2016, um, we talk about uh, on an if not why not basis. So. Um, you need to explain, even if you haven't done it, why you haven't done it or why it's not included. So, you know, days are gone, the days are gone where you could just not talk about a, uh, uh, um, you not talk about a subject or, and, and, and ignore it. Now you're required. So when the JSC and the readers panel uh, starts looking at uh, reviewing a CPR, they check, have you mentioned this? Have you mentioned that? And if not, it's sent back to you. So the JSC reader panel, um, again, it, it's to, to ensure that, um, that CPRs that are um, for listing or other uses of the JSC, that they comply um, with the codes, with the SAMREC code and the SAMVAL code. It's not there, I think the key is one must understand, it's not there to validate that the work that has been done is correct or not. That's still up to the competent persons to ensure that they do it right. But it's to ensure that, uh, again, that, you know, that all uh, comments have been done. And, and usually when we do these reviews, there'll be, um, you know, depending on the quality of the CPR, a few comments to, to quite, a few, uh, quite a few comments that need to be rectified. So it's one of the things that uh, the other uh, bodies look at and, and think that we've got right. It, it, it's something uh, that South Africa does that the others don't do. Um, and it, it does improve uh, our reporting. The other thing that the the JSC readers panel, um, and it's for solid minerals and oil and gas, we also look at the integrated reports, um, our annual reports, and over the the last probably five to six years, there's been a, a huge improvement in the annual reports. You know, um, seeing companies at times some companies incorrectly using incorrect words and and things like that or not including enough information in the annual report so by by the review committees uh, or the JSE readers panel doing these re reviews it's made a, a quite a an improvement um, in in this area um, yeah um, the readers panel is selected you know on, on semi-permanent uh, table of, of, of um, people that are well versed in valuations and resource estimations and reserves estimations. Um, we've you know, addressed that we need uh, to 
previously we we didn't have um, ESG people on board, so we've you know addressed that as well to ensure that uh, our reporting is improved upon. Um, and it's quite stringent rules in that you know you have a turnaround time of 14 days for the the first review and seven days for the the other reviews that are being done um you know sometimes it might take two or three three times for it to, to go through um important to know you know the the, the jsc reader panel looks at um you know whether there's any conflict of interest is confidential issues um, the readers do get paid um, um a fee to do it um but it's you know sh short hours uh, it's not like they're doing days of work, but more like a day or two type of thing. Um, but again, it, 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 it makes a very um, good uh, improvement of our reporting since we've been using the panels. Um, so as I highlighted before, the, the, the SAMREC code was first formed in 1994. Um, first edition came out in 20, uh, 2000 and and I'm I I've kept my my original copies and if you you know if you go back and you look at 2000 the first issue um, and when it was first incorporated into the JSC in section 12 and you compare to where we are in, in the 2016 version we've we've moved a long way we've you know made corrections um, if you go back and look at an inferred definition of an inferred category and, and what it looks like now, it's been modified. Um, so, you know, it, it's not perfect by any means, but again, um, the code is a guideline of the minimum standards one would apply. And, and some companies do better than others. Um, um, but as a general comment from my point of view, my personal point of view, is you know we have seen that um, uh, that the large mining companies and and on the individual on the individual mines a lot of not all the competent people that are there are as familiar with the code as perhaps they should be um, so you know there are, is that area of always improving in terms of of tutoring um, and 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 mentoring from uh, the well experienced at, at the mines to the the young up and coming um and you know i remember when i started you know it, it takes a few years and and um my comment um you know i've been dealing with the code for you know almost 20 years and i still uh, i still go back i still learn i still have different interpretations um, I think I'm well versed on it, on the code, and yet I would say I'm I still uh, every now and then go oh I didn't know that, and and so it's a never uh, never ending process about learning, and that would be my comments. Um, you know why do we want the code, and and uh, and I would say it's not always um, you know it's not always adhered to as as well as I'd like it to be. Um, I believe we, we, we should be, we as members or uh, as competent persons, we should be probably putting more complaints out uh, when we see work that's not to standard. And over the last three years, I don't think there has been a complaint raised, which it's not to say that there are reports out there that are, you know, this is, that are 100%. They're not 100%. There are reports that aren't, uh, aren't the standard um, it's we have a um, a problem in that people don't like to put in complaints is that theory of well people living in glass houses shouldn't throw stones but we must remember that you know if we don't uh, monitor our own uh, then other people will take over that uh, role and then we'll be complaining about that so anyway if we move on about the benefits he promotes best practice, accountability. The competent person is held accountable. Um, my one comment is sometimes the, the issuing company, the company should also perhaps sometimes be uh, held accountable. And I'll talk later about influence of companies when we talk about SAMVAL. But the same problem is with SAMREC. Uh, often uh, you've got to be careful that you're not being unduly influenced by people to make comments or statements that uh, 
might be more marketing than uh, appropriate for resource and reserve reporting. As I mentioned, you know, the common definition, so it makes sure that we have common language to extent common concepts. Um, it's written, and I think there's still work to be done to improve it that non-technical professionals can understand it. Um, probably would be a comment appropriate now is one of the problems we have, um, and, and as you know, the world becomes more prone to litigation, our reports are becoming bigger and bigger. And, and the reality is uh, you're, you, you know, you, most people will probably only maybe read the um, executive summary or look at sections that they're familiar with. But the, the odds of someone reading the whole CPR nowadays is, you know, they're four, they can be 400 pages. We had one recently over a thousand pages long. I mean, there's no small book, you know, it's a big book. Uh, I think the common is, is when you run into problems, that's when people will go into the CPR in detail and look, okay, what did you say about that? So again, at the end, the CPR is the go-to about the project, um, but uh, the readability is, is starting to become very difficult. And because of that, some of our terminology um, if you're not a mining person, you're not going to understand it. And in certain aspects, even as a mining engineer, you might not understand all the things written by the geologist or the metallurgist. Um, so it's something to be aware of. And, and, and we need to, you know, I think, address that going forward. Um, it is a basis for valuation. Um, you know, we can use it for comparative transactions and projects and things like that. I know as a uh, as a mining engineer, I'll often refer to certain um, either CPRs or NI431s that might provide some information to assist me with other projects. Um, in a sense, it, it does, you know, is a risk mitigation and in that, you know, we are highlighting in the report you know, things that are going on, what we're mitigating um, is relevant. Obviously, the SAM, SAMREC and SAM codes are relevant to South Africa and to Southern Africa and to Africa in general. Yeah. And again, to remember that the code sets out the required minimum standard for public reporting um, um, of, of expiration results, mineral resources and mineral reserves. Um, we say in South Africa, but remembering that, you know, that it's a South African code, but it can be applied elsewhere in, you know, you could use it if you owned a project um, in Africa, South America or anywhere else, nothing stops you from um, reporting your results according in accordance with the SAMREC code. And again, uh, the code isn't just for listed companies. Many private companies will um, publish or put out a public report um, or statement and, um, and say we've reported in, in, in compliance with the SAMREC code or in accordance to the code. And then, you know, if you've made that statement, um, uh, you need to, you know, work to the code. Um, as a member of the SIMM, uh, you're, you're also uh, re uh, required to, to work uh, to the SAMREC code. It's actually, when you read, uh, you know, our rules, it's in there. So, you know, beware of that. So, you know, if you are reporting um, expiration results and that, you, you know, you, you might say, well, there's not a public company. I, I can kind of cheat here. No, you, you are required. Um, as soon as you say you're in accordance and, and you haven't done it, uh, even a, 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 a private report can be subject to a, a complaint being raised. So, you know, that's, that's an important concept to remember. Okay. The other thing, obviously, it's the code is applicable to reporting to all styles of solid mineralization or economic deposits. And, you know, I highlight, you know, that uh, the, the term brine is also in it, which is, I guess you say, not, not really a water, but brine also um, is under the codes as well. Um, typically more in the United States that you'll see this, but uh, it, can, it can come up. I haven't seen it under SAMREC, 
but it doesn't mean that it hasn't happened or will not happen in the future. But it does not apply to oil and gas and water. And if we talk about the, the key foundation, uh, you know, my comment here is if you apply yourself to these three principles, you'll pretty well stay out of trouble. Um, you know, you should make sure that all relevant information is provided to the investors, the professional advisors, um, or potential investors that they would reasonably require and expect to find. Okay, kind of loosely worded things, but again, reasonable, relevant. This kind of guidelines is rather report too much than too little. If in doubt, report too much than too little. Okay. Transparency. A reader of a public report must be provided with sufficient information and the presentation of which is clear and unambiguous to understand the report and not to be misleading. And, you know, we, we still run across that every now and then that uh, things are not reported so clearly, um, perhaps for the benefit of the company. Um, so these are things that we can approve upon. But, uh, you know, I did run across this just recently. Um, but, uh, you know, not as clear as it should be. And, you know, it, you, you, the reader, the reader needs to have a better understanding than most. It's not written for the general public, and um, it wasn't clear. And and hence we try to improve these things. Um, the 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 competency again, it must be done by qualified and experienced persons. Um, and you know, even now, as I mentioned about the Canadians and Australians, you know, you know, discussions are had. You know, whether we say you need five years relevant experience. Um, uh, they, they, I don't think they'll change that, but uh, you know, one must make sure it's relevant um, experience. One of my comments that I see sometimes, I sometimes see geologists um, that maybe have a GDE, maybe not, uh, signing off on reserves. And I've, I've seen um, what I would say professional mining engineers signing off on resources and I would say, you know, that's what the Canadians and the Australians are kind of complaining about as well. Are you really competent? You know, as a mining engineer, I might know a, a lot about reporting, um, especially with the C CPRs about re what you need to report for the mineral resource point of view. But that does not make me competent or qualified. Um, you know, so I think one has to be careful with that and remembering you have to defend yourself amongst your peers. And the question, you know, if you feel you can, um, you know, well, go for it. But, uh, you know, you should have an honest look at it. And often um, we run into problems, whether, you know, is are, am I being transparent or is this material not? Often we will call friends, other competent persons to get that uh, opinion to say, you know, am I doing, is the work that I'm doing reasonable? So um, often I get phone calls, often I phone other CPs uh, asking, you know, what do you think? Uh, do you think this is reasonable um, or not? So again, you know, it, it um, you can, uh, I guess you say, phone a friend when need be. Okay. Again, I've kind of highlighted this, but this is the kind of official thing. Uh, of how we report, um, you know, and you can see the table is inferred, ind indicated, and measured. Um, as we increase our level of geoscientific knowledge and confidence, we can move ourselves down from inferred to indicated and measured. Probably the most important thing to highlight is that uh, indicated maybe move to probable, probable mineral reserve. There might be cases where measured might be downgraded to a probable mineral reserve where we might find there's one of these modifying factors that we're not quite um, comfortable with or we believe maybe more work is required we as a competent person might downgrade it um, and it, you know might be density it, it, it could be other things it could be the prices that more work needs to be done um, but anyway the, the, that ability is there and then 
you know, the, the, the gap uh, above probable. Many, many years ago, we had a thing called um, a possible reserve, which we don't use anymore. But I highlight it because um, every now and then you might find um, usually someone quite elderly maybe referring to a possible um, reserve. Um, I, I gave a presentation a while ago saying, well, maybe we should go back and look at this possible uh, reserve because when we do valuations, we often use inferred to do valuations. And when we do that, we also apply modifying factors to it. We sometimes use inferred in our life of mind plan and we apply uh, modifying factors. So we're doing everything but declaring it a possible reserve. Um, uh, and remembering with the Denver Accord in the early days, that was said, no, we won't do it. Um, but again, you know, it's uh, one must just be aware of at times uh, we may be um, uh, modifying inferred for whatever reason. We can't declare it, but we still we still do it. OK, um, just a guideline in terms of, of the re re reading the code. Um, when you open up the book, uh, it's pre presented predominantly in a normal typeface um, with the definitions highlighted in bold, as you can see down below. Um, and uh, the guidelines in italics um, in their place um, be below the, the definitions. And they're there, there to provide assistance and guidance to the reader when interpreting the code. So it just helps to, to um, give some um, background to it. Um, and again, I, I won't say that uh, the code is 100% perfect. Um, and even with the, the rewrites, uh, there's still improvements to be made. Um, again, uh, the JOR code that was written in 2012 is now being rewritten. It's been issued out for commentary. So you're seeing that uh, about every 10 years, the code's being rewritten. Um, um, I think it'd be interesting to see they've hired professionals to assist on the on the JOR code this time instead of volunteers. Um, and we'll see what comes out of it. But like I say, there are uh, <clears throat> rumblings about uh, quality of work and things like that, which will continue to, to happen. Um, moving into the code, uh, you know, as we say, if we're talking about increasing level of geoscience knowledge, um, we're talking about tons and grade are reported to reflect, you know, to reflect the different levels of, of that information. Um, and, you know, I think it's important to know um, the competent person is, is makes the estimate to, to, and, and based on the, uh, uh, on, on the, information applied uh, based on the quality distribution and, and quality of data. Uh, and there's no, you know, little magic uh, saying do this as inferred, um, indicated it, it, and measured. It's really up to the competent person to determine, you know, based on this QA and QC and, and confidence of what it, uh, what it will be. And it's not always just based on borehole spacings, but there's other things that that will be looked at, um, you know. And of course, you know, one of the key things that's always important is the accuracy of density measurements, and and one that crops up a lot. Um, so you know, there's other things that one must be looked at. Um, but you know. Um, in, in coal, um, we provide a guideline for borehole spacing, um, which uh, that's the SABS Bureau, um, the standards. I don't personally like it in that we have 19 coal fields in South Africa. You're putting out a guideline that might be appropriate to one or two of them, but it's definitely not appropriate to all of them. And often competent persons will say, well, the code says this, therefore I'll use it. And one must be careful about that. Um, ultimately, the competent person is responsible for this. But you've got to be careful you're not being pushed to uh, by, by the manager or the person paying your salary to uh, stretch the limits. Um, and I'll show later when we get into examples, cases where 
measured, improved uh, with more drilling disappeared, which in my mind is not right. Um, exploration results. Um, the, the important thing, um, exploration reports, uh, results are important uh, in many operations. When we're first starting, we will report um, made known, you know, our results or what we're going to do or our exploration targets as a matter of obtaining funding um, at times to assist in our sampling, our drilling, our trenching and all those geological things we do. Um, so we need these exploration results um, um, to support the industry, but people doing this must be well aware of exploration results do not show reasonable prospects of economic, eventual economic extraction. They're not resources, they're pre-resources, um, you know, so, it, you know, an exploration target doesn't need to represent any discovered mineralization, you know, nor imply reasonable prospects. So, again, it, you know, one has to be careful, but when you're in that realm, um, there's, you know, a bit of, definitely a bit of risk to it, but um, can be potential on the other side. And like I say, the reason we have this is um, before we can get things to a resource, we may need funding, and this is where people will come in. Um, what's important, though, that it must be balanced reporting. Um, and if we're reporting for ex exploration targets, then we have to report it as a range. Um, you know, it's... Um, 100 to 150 million tons at a grade of you know 1.5 to 2.5 grams per ton by reporting it that way already you know that there is some um, um, uh, margin of error i guess you'd say in in it yeah if we talk um so when we talk to resource estimation, the, the key word is RP triple E comes up and, and, and it's, it's very important. Um, we have to have reasonable prospects for eventual economic extraction. Um, the Americans have taken out the word eventual and they say for economic extraction. Um, you know, sometimes the reason they've taken it out is, you know, what is eventual? Uh, for an iron ore mine, it might be uh, 50 years. For a gold mine, maybe 10 years. So, you know, you have to see what is eventual um, and um, re realistic assumptions. So I would say from 2000 to now, where we are now, the days of a geologist doing this in isolation um, are gone. You need to communicate with the mining engineer, the metallurgist, the environmentalist, all bring them in. And, and, you know, look at what's reasonable. Um, and, and we're not talking about, you know, at one stage, some guys were talking about, well, maybe we should have a scoping report or a 20 page report. And, and to be, you know, I guess to be negative about it, I think it's, you know, consultants trying to, you know, create more work for them because many companies don't have time to do this and then they would hire a consultant to do it. So we're not saying that it, it might be a memo it could be a express, uh, express, um, Excel spreadsheet. The key is that you're, you know, when you're bringing in these, it's not my assumption. Um, it's, uh, you know, I've talked to the metallurgist. He, he believes that the recovery is of this range. I've talked to the mining engineer. He, you know, believes that the uh, the cost uh, is will be this. The stripping ratio will be that. Often. Um, the geologist will ask the planning department just to run a pit shell around it, just to kind of see, you know, what will happen and, and, and that type of thing. So again, it doesn't have to be in, in huge amount of work, but um, it should be a team effort and you should be looking at all the things, engineering and legal infrastructure, you know, and, and understand, you know, if I my property is, is, uh, in a uh, national reserve, a game park, um, Kruger Park or something, the odds of that becoming um, a, a project or, or a resource are, are very limited. Um, you know, so, yeah, I think the key here is um, in resource estimation is team effort and uh, not to be left behind. Inferred, um, you'll see later on, I'll talk about inferred. Inferred, <clears throat> inferred is one of those for me as my uh, pet peeve, it's, it's, 
it is um, often abused. Um, you can argue sometimes, you know, what's inferred. The new definition, you know, really um, does look at this in more detail. Um, the comment now that we're saying when with inferred is with further drilling, we would expect it to be upgraded to um, to indicate it. Um, so yet, even so, there's no guarantee. Uh, so one must understand that inferred is geological effort, evidence and sampling assumed but not verif verified geologically or through grade continuity. Okay. So, you know, there is that in or aspect. There is some area of uh, work to be done. So as, one, as long as one understands um, that this information is limited, um, you know, it might be on outcrops, trenches, pits, workings, some drill holes, um, you know, but it's limited uh, information. There's some uncertainty to it. I think you'll be fine. Uh, and, and, and as long as when you're, you know, as resource people, we, we don't overstate uh, or inferred. And there have been situations where people have uh, been very generous with the inferred part of you, point of view. Um, yeah. So remember that. Um, key on this one is really to say inferred mineral resources cannot be converted to mineral reserves and must not be stated as part of a mineral reserve. So that's really one of the, the key basics uh, of it. Okay. All right. So key is that there's uncertainty. All right. Um, the key um, for us in South Africa, we will use inferred. We can use it in, uh, inferred in our mine planning and our mine design. Not all the codes can do that, but we can. And part of the reason is we have some deep gold mining operations. One could argue, you know, the Bushveld, uh, very continuous. Um, and same with the Witwatersrand, you know, the, the geology is well spread. And so there can be. The key thing is if you are using inferred, you must have full disclosure. Um, and when we do our planning, we should be showing our you know, our results with and without the inferred. So if I run my financial model, I'll compare the results of my mine plan financial model with inferred in it and without inferred. Then the reader or the investor can see how sensitive you are to the inferred category. Um, you know, I sometimes laugh because, you know, often you'll see when you get to infer the grade is usually a little bit better and you know so again be careful how we use inferred um and and knowing that you know often we don't expect all of inferred maybe to be um, although we say with further drilling inferred it should go to to um, indicated um maybe not all of it does so we do see that so indicated part important part about indicated um um, you might say uh, the, the locations, the boreholes are spaced, uh, you know, are too widely spaced for geological or grade continuity, but are spaced enough for us to uh, assume continuity. We have enough uh, confidence in indicated that we can do mine planning on it. Um, inferred, although we might do mine planning on it, it's really, we're not, our confidence, we say, is not enough confidence in inferred to do mine planning. And therefore, because of that lack of confidence, we can't call it a reserve. Uh, but in the indicated, we have enough confidence now that we can call it to a probable uh, reserve. Um, often you'll see large open pit mines that will, that are operating for years, maybe only drill to indicate it um, and not take it to measure it anymore um, due to the you know experience that they have with the deposit. Um, but it's enough for a reserve uh, and uh, therefore, you know, one can uh, do financial modeling and, and things like that. So we have sufficient, uh, sufficient confidence for mine design, mine planning and economic studies. Um, you know, so we can apply this economic viability. What you have to watch out for, like I mentioned before, is um, some some companies taking uh, 
scoping level work and saying that it's done to enough level to do mine design and economic studies and it's not the case and in one case you know the company had to uh, uh, withdraw their the reserve uh, declaration on a company because they applied scoping study levels. So measured, obviously, this is, you know, very important in especially new projects where the banks might, um, people loaning you money might require you to use this category or get to this category of measured and improved during the duration why you need to re repay the bank or the loan you know for the first couple of years of the mine you might want uh, your resources and reserves to reflect measured and um, improved um, until payback period but it's based on uh, spacely uh, closely spaced uh, boreholes or information enough to confirm geological and and that's that keyword and grade continuity Okay, and again, the specifics of drill density are not prescribed. Uh, it's the judgment of the, you know, of the competent person to do that. Okay, so we have high level of confidence and the highest that we can get. And again, uh, I highlight, you know, there are examples where people have declared measured where maybe it wasn't. So again, doing the right things for the right reason. Okay. So you want to have no reasonable doubt that the tonnage and grade of the mineralization can be estimated to within close limits. Um, and any variation on within these limits would not materially affect the economics of extraction. So typically when we talk about materiality, we're talking about a 10% type of, um, of uh, issue. And later on, when I, when I talk about the examples, um, You'll, you'll see that um, in, in this case, instead of being uh, uh, an open cast section of the mine, it became underground. And it took, you know, a year off the, uh, out of a six year life of mine, it took one year away. I would call that um, uh, material. So maybe just keep that definition in mind when we get to that example. Another key point about mineral resource reporting um, is that, uh, you know, it, is being careful it's an estimate not a calculation um we we want to be careful about when we're reporting we don't want to combine our figures so we want to see uh, measured as measured indicated as indicated we don't want to combine the two categories and make a sum of it that's not allowed so that's some mistake we we used to see quite a bit not so much now um, and we want to separate uh, inferred, usually we'll separate the inferred out as well, um, highlighting, and we need to report um, mineral content, tonnages, tonnages and grades. So often you'll see in annual reports, people talking about, we have so many ounces of gold. Well, you can do that, provided that you also say that I have so many tons and I have at a, at a certain grade, because uh, without that, you... I've seen uh, people come and say, look, I have a lot of ounces of gold, but these ounces are, you know, over 200 meters and they're each one inch thick and they're not mineable. So that's not a resource. So that's why it's important to say, well, if it is, what is the corresponding, you know, grade grams per ton or, or you know, so that that's important. Uh, another common uh, error that we make, uh, especially, you know, I used to do it as well before I knew better. We don't use the term ore or reserve unless, uh, you know, when we're talking about mineral resources, we only can use ore, uh, an ore body. Uh, we talk about ore in writing only when we have a reserve. So that's something to remember. And, and that reserve means I have a, uh, a technical feasibility, um, economical viable at today's terms. Um, and I've applied the relevant modifying factors. So that's one must be careful. And then at the bottom, uh, and again, uh, an error that's, you know, 
when you're first doing that, when when you're doing your estimation, you don't report to you know 3.984. Um, so often we'll see uh, you know that level of detail in our reserve tonnage or our resource tonnage, and, and, and again you you want to make it more high level. You know, you know 680.3 million tons, not uh, you know down to the hundredth or tenth ton because we're not that accurate in our resource estimation so if you're less kind of clear to you we go to the reserve side um, the important thing about the reserves is we're including dilution and contaminating materials uh, so we need to account for losses um, that are expected to occur when they're mining okay so that's the key thing we have our in situ now we're talking about you know our, our run of mine and we talk about, you know, we we'll also talk about reporting, is it, you know, before the plant, after the plant, like in coal, is it, you know, is, is it run of mine coal tons or is it wash tons? Normally for hard rock, it's not a problem. We're normally talking about our um, run of mine, what comes before the plant. But that point, uh, the, the point of declaration is important. It can be more important for industrial minerals and things like that. As I mentioned before, you need to have done at least a pre-feasibility study or a life mine plan. But remembering, um, we've closed that gap that life of mine plan must be done to a pre a, to at least a pre-feasibility level study. So the good old days, you might say, ah, oh, it's a life of mine plan. Yeah, well, and to scoping level. Um, this still, one has to be careful. There's still, um, often things are done, uh, maybe not to the level it should be done. Um, maybe there's missing information. So again, one must be uh, diligent uh, at looking at the level of information that is applied. Have they done, uh, you know, uh, if you're doing it, has enough work, be, engineering work been done on infrastructure and things like that on the ESG? Be careful of assumptions and things like that, um, you, you know. Um, and, and the reason, you, you know, you have to have done all that work. I've worked on a number of projects that were at scoping level and you talk to the client and you say, Are you sure you have the mining right? Yeah, yeah. And then you find out they don't have it. They spent a lot of money on a project they didn't own. And, um, you know, um, currently, um, you know, getting our mining rights um, and um, renewals of rights can be very problematic um, water use license and things like that dealing with the government things don't come back as quickly as they should um, and um, so you know the the governmental uh, the right to mine must be very careful with these things you mustn't make an assumption that yeah i i have the mining right um, uh, and it will be given back to me. You know, be careful. Uh, weird and wonderful things have been happening in the recent time. Um, also, um, many operations are operating without uh, having gotten all full permissions, you know. Um, and you'll find there's a, a mine operating and they might not have even done an EMPR or, or any of the, uh, they might only have an expiration right uh, not a mining license, and yet they're mining. So one must be very careful when you're doing this work to ensure that you're covering all aspects of these modifying factors to declare a reserve. And you need to make sure that you are you go there. Um, you know, often the client will say, ah, you don't need to go there. You're just wasting money and my time and all that. Um, you know, I had a project once we wanted to do an open pit and then we found now, there's, there's either, you know, a village living on it that uh, if I move it, it's going to cost too much or a national power line or, or things like that that are making, you know, maybe a fatal flaw. So be careful with that. Okay. So again, you cannot, uh, just re-emphasize, cannot report a reserve unless there's a pre-feasibility study or a life of mine, again, done to that level. Okay. Probable. Um, same thing, um, we're moving indicated, and like I say, you can at times move from a measure to a probable where there's situations of uncertainty. Um, and I, you know, I've done it, others have done it, um, 
Um, so again, you can uh, do it uh, like, you know, um, so be aware of that. But in most cases, like I say, it's indicated being moved. Uh, again, same level. You're just moving your indicated uh, to it. Okay, your indicated moving to probable. And again, uh, most important thing is that you have realistic assumptions about all of these aspects, all of the modifying factors. Okay, and they must be disclosed, you know, all of them, not some of them. And like I say, you know, some of the things that we see is, you know, sometimes the infrastructure or something there is not there. Yeah. Again, if, um, I'll, I'll start. Um, we've got about an hour left. Um, so this is session three. What I, I, I've done is I've combined, you know, session one and two into two ones, you know, one presentation. So um, I'll, I'll quickly go, you know, through the SAMVAL code, our valuation code. Um, I think the comment is, you know, you know, due to time and things like that, uh, we, we don't go into, you know, examples and, and um, the different methods uh, completely on how you apply uh, apply the SAMVAL, um, but, but, you know, we, we do have workshops and, and courses throughout the, you know, the year, and, and so if one needs more information about that, um, there are those opportunities, um, and, you know, if, if one needs more, contact the, um, the, the, the SIMM, and I'm sure we can also introduce this as a, a lunch session or something like that. It can be done by uh, other people, myself, it doesn't matter. So if there is a need for more detailed kind of instruction in how to apply valuations, um, yeah, it, you know, contact uh, the SIMM and I'm sure we can make a plan. Um, if we talk about valuations, there's re really three basic ones that we use. Uh, Valmin from Australia, Samval from uh, South Africa, and then Simval uh, in Canada. Those are basic ones, uh, and, and and pretty similar to a to a large degree. Um, but today we'll talk about Samval, and it's you know basically we're talking about a mineral asset um, that you know has any which is any right to explore or mine or both that has been granted to the entity uh, entity holding such property. Or the securities of such an entity. So the SAMVAL really is intended to form a, a, the minimum standard and guidance for public reporting of a mineral asset valuation. Um, again, through a competent valuator. So catch me if I say CP, I mean CV in this case. Has a similar principles, material transparency, competency, which we covered, and then reasonableness. Um, is it reasonable? Now, that's already implied in the codes. Um, this is now stated more so. And you might say, you know, is my valuation unreasonable? Before one talks about evaluation and valuation, I mean, we're going to be talking about V valuation. Often it gets confused. Um, we also talk about mining engineers, we talk about evaluation with an E. And that's usually when we're talking about a technical report. Uh, we're looking you know, like a scoping study, risk study, we do the economics, those type of things. The valuation part is what we're putting a monetary value to the asset. Um, so evaluation, I might say, you know, in, you know, the scoping study or a feasibility study, I'll put all the technical aspects in and I'll, I'll say, okay, we have an NPV of this and a, um, um, uh, an IRR of that. The valuation, it might use uh, a cash flow method, which is an MPV, but um, it also could use other things, um, a cost approach or a market approach, but we're definitely putting a value. We have a piece of property, like a house, and we want to say, how much is this worth? And that's what we're really doing. Okay. So again, the valuation point, this won't we'll stick with that, but um, you know, so just remembering one is valuing, the other one is evaluating. Uh, and for the purpose of Samvel code, when do we want to do valuations? Uh, new stock exchange listings, uh, raising debt, equity financing, investment decisions, um, might do for facilitating negotiations, you know, 
mergers and acquisitions. Um, you know, it could be assessment of government charges, taxes, compensation. So you, you can read this internal corporate reports, uh, expert witness statements, as I mentioned, mergers, impairment calculations, accounting and financial reporting. So there's a whole host of them. Uh, and again, we talk about the principles. Uh, we've talked about reasonableness, but again, this is where, you know, would another, uh, but this is more, I think, also very tricky with the CVs. You know, would another person come up with the same kind of valuation that you have? Um, and it's very tricky, uh, you know, valuations. I, 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 when I was younger, I stayed away from because I always found that the clients are always unhappy. No matter what price you give them, uh, they always want more or you know, you're trying to sell your house or your, or your car. You think your car is worth, uh, you know, a hundred thousand, and the guy comes out and only wants to give you sixty thousand for it. And so, you know, there's that uh, expectation that you always have to deal with. And so, when you're doing valuations, you know, it's, you know, that is one of the hard things is managing expectations. So you got to make sure whatever you've done, what you ever have done. You know, does your material trans transparency and competency, but is it reasonable? Would another guy doing the same work come up with a comparable answer as you are? Are you far out? Um, and you've got to be careful because every now and then these do crop up um, and, you know, judgment is made upon you. Um, and we've seen some property owned by the Guptas that would be an example where <coughs> The valuation of the property came into dis dis dispute, came out into the public domain, you know, so it's not so great. So maybe just as a, a rule, you know, what do we mean by reasonable, you know, you know, agreement, if not among all, at least among a substantial number of people. So often, again, uh, you might uh, phone a friend. Or friends just to get a consensus you know and what am i do, what i'm doing does that sound appropriate is it right um, and sometimes your colleague will tell you well think about this think about that um what are you valuing so you know just on the right hand side typically you know we've got tons we've got grade we've got content we got troy ounces you know but you know you can't go and just this isn't you know you can't just simply do boom 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 it um uh, that's the value of the content. You know, we have to look at what are the, you know, what are the other aspects of it? Um, you know, how much does it take to, to extract it, uh, you know, to rec reclaim it? So all of these things have to be looked at and there are ways of, of applying it. So one must be, sim be careful that just doing this simple calculation, you know, th that's the value of the content. But, you know, have I covered, what about my recovery? What about the cost? You know, those type of things, you know, how much will this project that maybe has 10 million tons, how much will it bring in? Um, and that's what you're trying to value, valuing projects. Basically you have three approaches, um, right? We've got a cost approach, uh, market and income. So, and later I'll show you the table, cost approach is where, you know, we're probably dealing more with, um, maybe inferred expiration targets. We don't have a reserve for sure. Um, so it's based a lot on the historical historical cost on expiration and perhaps how we've added value through the geoscientific geos factorization. They sometimes call it a PM, PAM. So, you know, you've done work and you've, you know, you've found mineralization. How you've upgraded might be a, a, a multiplier that we apply, okay? Market approach is very similar to looking at a house where you're looking at a, a other properties that are similar to yours that have been sold, like we would do in a housing uh, market. But unlike housing, um, you know, our property market, we don't have as many uh, transactions. So we're looking at transactions. Sometimes it can be very easy. There's a lot of transactions and you want to compare you know, the market to the same market. I mean, if you're looking at open pit, you want to compare open pit gold. If you're looking at a mine, is it shallow or deep? So you want to compare, a, you know, apple to an apple, or if we talk about a house, 
you know, I want to compare my three bedroom house with a swimming pool, probably to another three bedroom house with a swimming pool. Um, you don't want to compare it to a one bedroom house or a, a mansion, you know, so those things come into it. Um, and then the income approach, which is probably the easiest out of all of them in that you're just applying a cash flow. So, uh, you know, you have reserves, you have a study done, um, you're applying, you know, you put into a cash flow and you get your NPV. And, and, and when we do this valuation, you know, we'll have a high and low value um, to it um, and a preferred value. So we have high, low and preferred and we'll, we'll apply these to all of them. And in the Samvel case, we have to do two approaches as well, which is very important. So I always have to do the market approach. And depending on where I am on the curve, uh, and I'll show that just now, um, um, I either will have to do a cash flow, like I say, value and use, uh, or I'll have to do a cost approach. So, and as it says there, use more than one. Um, so one of the things on the guiding principle that you know I warn, like to warn, especially when we're talking about introduction to it, is you got to be careful. So you're being paid by a company, and this is the same for even resources and reserves. You're being paid by a company um, to do a public report. You've got to be careful that you're not being unduly, uh, you know, uh, influenced by others. You, you know, you must report on this, you know, um, transparency and materiality and be competent. You know, um, you must tell anything that might affect the public perception about the, the project or the value. You cannot omit it or misrepresent it. You can't try to sweeten it. Um, and yet at times you might be unduly uh, influenced by it. Uh, so we, we've got to remember that, you know, the code sets out the minimum requirements for reporting, um, you know, in, in terms of resources, reserves and valuations. Um, so if we talk about the, the methodologies of three, the cash flow, uh, cash flow approach relies on value and use principles. So, you know, we're looking to find out what is our, 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 our net present value. Um, and, you know, we're going to use what are we going to do? Indicate a value by convert, converting future cash flows. You know, this is a financial model to a certain, a single current value or NPV really. Um, and that becomes, you know, for this estimation of the market value. So the valuation, the present value shall be gen generated by using a discount rate derived from market uh, conditions. So, you know, one of the million dollar questions is, you know, what discount rate are you going to use? You know, so these are things you have to explain. Um, and it's up to you as a evaluator how you're going to use it, you know. Are you going to use WACA or, or, or how? So these are, uh, you know, important aspects. Uh, again, transparency and things like that. So just kind of a, from an income approach, uh, discounted, these are the top things you're looking at. So obviously, um, you know, like I say, you're getting it usually from a, a, a feasibility study or a life of mine plan where you have tonnage of grade and a mineral reserve. Um, you might uh, use some uh, resources inferred um, that uh, you're going to apply uh, modifying factors to. You have your annual rate of production. So, you know, if you can picture yourself doing a cash flow model, um, you're going to look at revenue, you know, what gold price you're going to use or what metal price you're going to use. Again, is it reasonable? Where did it come from? You need to explain all of that. Um, you know, what kind of What's my saleable mineral commodity? Um, and then, you know, what are my costs? What, you know, what are my, you know, my mining and met metallurgical and things like that? What kind of income taxes are going to be applied? Um, what kind of, uh, you know, to get to profits, you've got to remember you got royalties, um, capital expenditure. Um, and, you know, we also got to remind we have, uh, we might have working capital to think about and sustain sustainable capital, you know, so often the, you know, sustainable capital might be left out. You got to make sure are these things done appropriately and then, you know, you end up getting your cash flow. So, 
Now, without going into to, to great detail, it's that basic cash flow modeling. Um, the market approach, um, like I said, if you think about market approach, it's really about a willing buyer, willing seller. Um, like, like I say, the, the easiest way to compare it is to a, uh, to a house or property. Um, and what you're doing is you're, you're looking at these transactions for similar type of mineral assets um, done at an arm's length transaction, you know, again, willing buyer, willing seller. And we look at what are the, the values. Um, but again, you have to compare, you know, similar things. You, you can't compare selling a underground gold project in dollars per ounce um, and compare it to a surface mine. Uh, you, you know, you want to have some uh, similarity to it. Just like in property, you can't compare what a house, a three bedroom house will cost in Johannesburg and maybe what will cost in, in Cape Town or Durban. So again, you've got to be careful when you're, you're doing transactions that might happen in Canada or Australia when you're trying to compare it to a project in South Africa. And just kind of, uh, you know, comparable transactions is an example of, of some coal projects, uh, you know, that, that You'll, you'll see the kind of numbers being, you know, this was what happened, how much was spent, and, and you can look at the resources and reserves, and later on you'll, you'll go back and, and work it out to perhaps uh, dollars per ton um, or rand per ton um, type of number. But again, you, you, you'll see the status, uh, you know, operating, feasibility study, care and maintenance. So again, you, you want to look at, you know, similar type of, uh, of projects is if your projects in the, you know, advanced exploration, you want to compare to similar projects of advanced exploration. And, you know, the hardest part about this is you might find um, um, few uh, transactions to work with. And then that, that, that's where it can be very difficult. Um, and that's why, you know, um, becoming a valuator is, 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 takes quite a bit of time and effort and uh, mentoring. And then again, the, uh, the last being the cost approach relies on historic and future amounts spent on a, a mineral aspect. Um, and again, as you've added value, um, you might have an enhancement on, on it. Um, so, you know, again, um, the principle that a buyer will pay no more for an asset than the cost to obtain an asset of equal utility, whether purchased or by construction. But the idea is, again, you might have added value by um, declaring inferred or an expiration uh, result or inferred resources. So, you know, as you have brought it up the value chain, you you can find that you, you might use a multiplier on the other side you might have drilled out a whole piece of property and found nothing and then you know unfortunately your your, your multiplier is zero because there's nothing there um so you know um people aren't going to want to buy uh, a block of uh, a mineralization uh, a block of land with no mineralization on it so again the idea is when you're selling this you've added value maybe you need people to buy in you need funding so this this would be an approach to kind of put a value to it again sometimes it can be difficult so an example you know here is we often would go um you know the value is based on on the size of the project um and you know again often we'll we'll put low value high value preferred value you have these x transactions and you'll kind of get a, an average and you can kind of see you know this is how we would get an example of a um uh, for a valuation of a um, expiration project or using the cost approach and one has to you know i've done done these before where the, the client is very um unhappy because you know it, it, at this time he didn't have resources and and because you're using area you know you you perhaps don't get the value that you want um, and the way to do that to improve upon that is you do more exploration drilling and uh, you know um, then you can use your market transaction becomes more relevant and uh, you're then you can start comparing 
other projects because what happens at, at this stage you don't find too many projects and um, that are um, more exploration and the price that you receive is usually lower than if you bring it up the value chain and have inferred or indicated or even measured resources. Um, so as I said before um, and you know repeated you got to be ca careful that you know your work is not unduly um, influenced and that you've made adequate disclosure. P people have to understand how did you get to your discount rate? Um, you know what assumptions have you made um, and, and that type of thing why have you applied uh, uh, enhancement uh, modifying factor things like that. Um, so the guiding principle, again, the code, the uh, SAMVAL code, uh, short, has a table one to guide us. But, you know, uh, to remember the CV, you're responsible for assessing technical data, um, right? And, and this is, you know, again, what the, the Australians and the Canadians are saying, you know, have you done enough work? Have you... Um, had enough time uh, to look at the information, the parameters, and all those things. Um, again, you know, you have to be careful. You you're bidding for a project, and maybe you underbid. You want the project, you don't put a lot of hours to it, but you're still responsible to ensure that you've done enough due diligence uh, to ensure that your your work is defendable. Whether you're charging the client uh, ten rand or 10,000 Rand or 10 hundred, you know, or 100,000 Rand, at the end of the day, you still have to work to a standard. Uh, and, and that's where sometimes it becomes a problem. You, you know, you don't have enough hours in the day, and, and you, but you can't, uh, um, you know, you can't cheat on the work. You can't say, well, I only have 10 hours, I'm only going to apply 10. Your work, you're signing off on it, people are, are, are using your uh, valuation and so you've got to make sure that it's done right you know people will rely on your work and and at the end of the day again you as a cv will be accepting responsibility for the uh, mineral asset valuation and i must say you know uh, as well there's a bit of an interlink between the cv and uh, the cp as well because some of the modifying factors the CV will use, you know, in certain cases. Right. So the relationship, this you'll get out of the out of the uh, Samval book, but under certain situations, um, when we say not generally used, um, I guess we're covering ourselves, it's usually you can read that as not used, um, widely used, widely used. So early expiration projects, we're going to use market and cost. Advanced staged, um, we'll probably move to market. Uh, again, market and cost, um, maybe income in special cases, but really, you know, uh, it depends. When we get to this, it depends on what kind of studies have been done. But at this stage, development, we're going to see feasibility studies. So we'll use that and we won't use cost. Production properties in, you know, a mine operating, again, Income will probably be the, you know, widely used, you know. Um, dormant properties, properties, but economically viable, you can see there. Again, why, you know, income in market. Um, if it's not economically viable, we would probably be looking at market and cost. And the same defunct, um, again, market and cost. So, Again, you'll see if you have to do two cases, obviously market is always going to be used. Um, so within a short period of time, you'll become an expert in that. Um, and like I say, in reality, income um, is, 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 is quite, uh, to me, very easy to do. Um, cash flow modeling, we tend to know better. Cost is a little bit trickier. Um, I must say, you know, again, if you go onto the internet and you look, Andre von der Merver has done a, a really good uh, paper on, uh, um, I think it was written while he was still at MSA on, on the cost approach for early stage exploration. So there, again, there's a lots of information on the internet on, 
on these approaches. Um, and, 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 and yes, you might go back from the beginning when, when this was really first coming through in the, in the early 2000s, but maybe that's not a bad place to start, but you'll get a good understanding of, of how these are used and, and, and under which circumstances. Um, this is a, a evaluation, evaluation methodology curve. In my mind, maybe not 100% perfect. You know, there's some interpretations to it, but you can see as soon as, you know, I'm, I'm in the point where I've proved improbable, I'm, I'm going to be using, you know, the income approach. And you can see the income approach and market approach, uh, you know, from this level here, but really your income income approach once you have a pre-feasibility study you have a life of mind plan you're gonna your 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 methodology is definitely going to be in, in you know using the income but remembering we're always using market as well but um <clears throat> you might one has to be very careful you know when you start using a desktop study for applying your income approach so you know really you know we want uh reserves uh, re reserves declared um, cost approach is you know again as we mentioned on the early you know could be re reconnaissance um, inferred it's not to say that you can have uh, you wouldn't take it even further uh, in indicated uh, or even measured if that's all all the information you have and no one has done um, any technical studies so again you know you you use this as a bit of a guideline okay each is like i say a number of interpretations um so um you know we can use uh, mineral resources in an income approach if mineral reserves are also present um so yeah but to use mineral resources um without mineral reserves because with mineral reserves it means you know we have technical information that we can use uh, where it becomes dangerous is you're now trying to apply uh, modifying factors as evaluator when you don't know the details of the project so that's why it's so important to have a mineral reserve i've got to have work done to a pre-feasibility level as a minimum that information I can use, I have dilution, I have my ore losses, I can use it, I can put it into a cash flow or an income approach. Okay. So if we only use measure and indicated, obviously using measure and indicated, uh, the, the, the risk becomes quite high. And, you know, I've seen it done. Um, I don't like it. Um, and I wasn't taught that way, but there are, people that will I've seen it used and so one must just be careful right if you're going to use it um, you might say well there's a higher risk to it and you should be applying um, a higher discount rate or or something like that uh, to reduce the quantum of the, the mineral resource remembering um, when I have measured and indicated, that doesn't mean that all of that will be uh, transferred to a reserve or something like that. So again, just be careful. Um, my opinion is, you know, don't do it at all. Okay. I have quite a few slides on inferred um, because this is where, in my mind, um, inferred can be abused at times. Um, so I highlight a few things. You know, we can't we can use inferred in our mind plans. Um, but you know one must be very careful how one uses it and make sure that you know you you've clearly stated that you're using um, inferred um, again and then where are we using it um, um, you know often you know if we have a 20-year life of mine um, if i have inferred you know after 10 years the impact is is not quite high where you really have to be careful and i've seen it before is you know we we start an operation the near surface resources might be inferred it goes into the mine plan and um, it has uh, at the early years of a, a cash flow it has a huge impact so um one must be very careful about that um so you must conduct it with care um 
applying modifying factors to infer min mineral resources um you know that is not part of the pre-feasibility is scary um, it's not desirable to me it's misleading again i've seen it done um i don't recommend it um the risk, you know, you have to understand the risk of applying a DCF to the value of inferred. Um, again, it's it, with modifying factors, it's, it's you know, uh, it, it is of concern, you know, knowing that I still use the old term that, you know, some or none of this inferred resource may be ever economically viable. Um, although the new definition says when I do drilling of inferred, I'd expect it to be um converted to um, indicated but it also says but that may not be the case so again be very careful uh, and again inferred is inferred from geological evidence uh, we don't have enough to do mine planning uh, yet we we at times apply uh, modifying factors to it um, so, you know, if you're going to use it, please you know, make a clear statement of the confidence, the risk with it. Um, again, you may run with and without inferred in your, you know, if you're doing a cash flow model, um, you know, and, and so you want to uh, explain that and you might have to explain why the valuation may or may not um, be also why it might not be on a, a SAMRIC compliant report. Um, you got to remember you have to apply more than one approach uh, as well. So even though you might have included inferred in your discounted cash flow, um, you might decide that perhaps a market evaluation might be the more uh, appropriate uh, evaluation method. Uh, again, be careful that you're not just doing the highest value to make the client happy, but what is you know what is realistic. Um, and of course, you always have to state what modifier factors I'm applying. And so we, we've highlighted, you know, the caution. You must make sure that you don't confuse resources with reserves. You allow the, um, the uh, reader to understand what's going on. Um, okay. And understand that um, resources still have a long way to go before they're uh, an economic deposit or reserve. And so, you know, be careful um, when you're doing that with any of that. So, so my comment uh, probably is, you know, when you're using uh, inferred resources, uh, make sure you highlight it, uh, you make the, the correct commentary um, and just be very careful. Okay. Same thing with scoping studies. Um, low levels of confidence uh, we've got to be careful when using this information companies nowadays will go out and and report um, re the 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 results of a scoping study so we've got to be careful that we don't misuse that uh, remembering is not good enough to declare reserve um, so be careful so we use these PEAs, and 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 they're, they're, the idea is it gives the uh, uh, the investor potential the the potential the viability. But what has happened over time is uh, when we take our PEA and compare it to what actually happens after it becomes a feasibility study or, or becomes a project, you find that often the scoping study or PEA is quite out by a lot. Um, and again the canadians uh, have been you know highlighting you know one must be careful um you have to highlight to people that a scoping study is not a pfs um, um but also be careful that we're not too um optimistic um we want our scoping study to to be realistic assumptions and and what happens it's not always the case okay so be careful um so again, uh, my thing, uh, you know, the intention of the Sambo code through its definition of exploration and development properties. Um, so the cash flow is meant for projects where the, the economic viability has already been established. So, you know, be careful. Um, uh, use appropriate when you're using the cash flow. Um, and again, 
the reason we see cash flows are easier to do. Doing um, you know, a, a cost approach is not always the easiest thing to do. A lot of the information is missing. Uh, it, it's not easy. That's you know. So be careful that um, you know that you don't over you know you're not um, um, over optimistic uh, and, and misuse scoping studies. Okay, um, but again, you're going to be looking. We're looking for the best uh, valuation, and you know we're going to be using these three. And yeah. And that'll be, um, you know, you'll pick the right way. But the, the key thing, there's no such thing as a quick, cheapy specials. It's only for internal use. You've got to be careful. Um, the comment is you will be audited. Some will be looking at your work and, you know, is the work that, you did, that you've done, is it right? Is it appropriate? Okay. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, that's the end of uh, the SAMVAL. Uh, like I said, I've done fairly quick, um, I just want to see, uh, uh, just trying to see, I just, uh, someone made a comment about load shedding, so I don't think we have to worry about that, a real, real question, okay, so, um, I'm going to see if I can get to my last, the examples, which we can do is the, the examples are not uh, uh, not a long one. All right, so just a few case studies of what we've seen over time. Um, recent issues. Um, so what we've seen in terms of uh, competent persons reports and things like that. Life of mine plan uh, supporting the mineral reserve statement not uh, does not, uh, sorry, my English is terrible, does not have um, or has insufficient tailing storage capacity to support the plan. So what I'm trying to say there in bad English is, <clears throat> you know, one of the things you have to check is in your mine plan, do I have an, enough sufficient space to put my tailings when I'm mining? And this becomes important that, you know, after a while you'll find that uh, the tailings dam at TSF was built for phase one and now we're on phase three. Um, has it has the tailings dam been um, is there a tailings dam design done and has it been costed if not uh, you might you know you could argue that there's a problem with it you're you know, you're you, you you don't have the capability of, of, of mining the full life of mine if I don't have area to to put my tailings and it can be an issue in that either the, there's no no space on the property or there might be environmental issues or money issues, but you know, you need to check that. The other one we see sometimes is the the life of mine life of mine plan exceeds the capacity of the beneficiation plant. So the plant can do you know two hundred fifty thousand tons a month, but meanwhile, our my uh, our life of mine plan is running at two eighty three hundred. Um, and uh, you know oh no but the plant has a, a bit of excess you know be careful how much excess so uh, you know it, it's nice uh, to do um, but um, it, you know makes your cash flow look better because you putting more tons lower cost but in reality can you actually do that and and it can have an impact uh, obviously uh, a lower throughput means a higher operating cost means less you know, maybe less uh, operating costs and, and perhaps it changes the cutoff grade to reduce actually the, the resource and reserves that you're going to be able to mine. Um, I've seen recently, you know, a mineral resource conversion to mineral reserve where the calculation is just not anywhere close to being uh, real. So, you know, the fact that you have two tables uh, and it says one's a resource and one's a reserve, you know, check, does it make sense? Um, have they actually taken into consideration the dilution and the mining loss properly? Okay. And as I mentioned earlier about the infill drilling, you know, wiped out 15% of the proved mineral reserve uh, with infill drilling. So we're getting ready to mine the open pit. And then we find out that, you know, one of the seams, the coal seams is, is not there. And I no longer have an open cast mine. I now have to go to underground mining. Um, obviously it changes the costs. Um, 
it took a year out of the life of the mine and it resulted in a significant drop in the share price. Um, was any action taken? No, um, but it should have been um, because it's not right. And, and I remind you of what we said about uh, measured. A good example, a bit dated now, but uh, Endeavor Mining, you know, reporting in ounces. Um, you can't do that, right? You need to report in gray, uh, in grade and tonnage. So again, you, you can, and then you can see mineral resources are inclusive of the mineral reserves, but um, you know, you can, you can comment on the ounces, but you need to report in, um, in grams and tons as well. Okay, so good example of that. And they should know better, yeah. Um, another one from a chrome operation, um, you can see I've got million ounces of 4E. I've got my chrome. So, you know, here they're reporting platinum and chrome. But, you know, again, they're reporting in millions of ounces and, the, and contain chrome. They're not telling me grade and tons. So, again, you know, incorrect way of reporting. Coal resource statement, um, reporting GTS, gross tons in situ, which we don't do. Um, I've got measured, but as you see here, I don't, and, and I've got a reserve here, but I don't know what kind of coal do I have? There's no information about the coal quality. So I've got tons, but I don't have grade or quality. So again, uh, listed company. Uh, this is a listed company. Um, uh, it's not doing things right. You know, there's no saleable coal reserves, you know, because, you know, are you washing it? There's no breakdown of probable or proved. Um, if it's open cast, they didn't mention, you know, what kind of mining method. Is it surface underground? And, you know, um, didn't report, you know, the, the tonnage is not reported as a range, you know, again, we, if it's an expiration target, we need a range. Um, another one from a different company putting out, I've got these, you know, different projects, again, using old terminology, total tons, gross tons, total tons, mineable tons. But again, I don't know anything about my resource, about the coal. You know, does it go to Eskom? Does it burn? We don't know. Um, and then you have another one, mine A. At least it's giving you know us information. But again, no no information. So what you find is the coal guys are great at giving you tons, and and you know over time it's getting better. You know, see most of you know twenty sixteen, the most of them were twenty thirteen. Um, but not good at giving us uh, information on, on the coal qualities. Um, example of a good, uh, a good one um, from SRK back in the day where you get your area seam thickness um, and then underneath they, they're giving you the information that you need. Okay, early days, but they're giving you the information you need. You need to know your volatilities. You need to know your CV. Um, you need to know sulfur. So there's a lot of information you want to know on, on coal. Um, and this volatiles uh, is very important because sometimes um, the guys uh, ignore it and you might have coal that actually isn't acceptable for ESCOM, for instance. Um, and they put it in and it makes numbers look different. But in reality, um, devolatilized coal, uh, you can't send to a a plant. Um, and I think this is the last one. Um, um, again, uh, there's been a couple of these where, you know, this is a gold operation where the work done was not correct. Um, the ore crushing system never worked. Um, the ore can never be made small enough um, to process. The consultants, the three companies, failed to get a representative sample of the ore. Um, they failed to estimate the report of the mining costs properly. Um, 
the recovered gold was wrong all you know they got it totally wrong and basically you know they were taken to task and 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 they were sued and the the comment would be you know uh this type of multi-million dollar fiasco um that you know consultants can't expect to walk away from this kind of work so uh you know it's getting like i say more and more um, um uh, with legal action taken of, of poor things. So, you know, from the examples, you know, um, you know, I would say, or from this course or, or talk, you know, the SAMREC code, you know, is, it won't solve all our problems. Um, it has room for improvement, but it, overall, it's not a bad document. Um, and again, when, when, in, when in doubt, one can uh, communicate ask friends uh, and and check about reasonableness um, but what we find is is you know um, when i do uh, reviews of companies and things like that there there's a long way there's a poor understanding of the samrec code um, one must make sure that one understands as, as best as one can there are courses um, people should be attending and and the course isn't just for the the perhaps the the presentations but also talking to people um and you know meeting people that you in future might be using as um colleagues to phone on is this reasonable so the key thing you know knowing what's right it doesn't mean much uh, you know unless you actually do it you know you do what's right and and like i say i find that although a lot the, the large companies know what to do that learning um and monitoring to people that are doing their um, first or second attempt at uh, defining, you know, declaring resources and reserves, probably don't have as good an understanding of the SAMREC code as they should. Thank you. Yeah. So that um, that ends the our session for today. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, I'll close that. Any questions? Am I missing anything? I don't think so. If not, um, if there are any questions, you can always send an email. Um, and like I say, if there's other aspects, um, if there's any, you know, if you have aspects of of, uh, of of the code that you'd like more of or more detail, we do do um, in, you know, the SIMM does usually on a every other year a workshop on how to do codes. Okay, uh, Mbogani, I see your hands up. Um, go ahead. I think you can ask your question. I hope I can answer it. Okay. Uh, thank you, Steve, for a very insightful uh, presentation. Uh, I, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, the first one uh, being, uh, well, it was asked earlier on, but uh, so is the code going to include uh, maybe guidelines on how to do certain things, like probably, let's say, sampling, uh, drilling and and related uh, processes in that value chain to say if, so if you are to yes if I can answer that one then you can ask the second question the code does tell you things that you should consider and what you need to report under you know sampling and and guidelines you know like duplicates and and um, 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 what's the other one um, blanks um, It'll tell you, you know, the it'll indicate you must describe the chain of custody and things like that. But it 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 might not go down to telling you all the the information uh, that you might, you know, uh, you know, it'll infer to the information, but it won't give you a, I guess you say, do this, do that, and um, totally, it won't answer all your questions. Some things you would have to infer. Um, I think it goes a long way to tell you what you need to report. Once you see what you need to report, um, you know what you need to capture. Um, but it, it, it doesn't give you, you know, perhaps 
the procedures, uh, uh, um, if, if that's, you know, maybe the question won't give you the procedures, um, but that will come from your company um, anyway. But it will tell you um, in quite detail, uh, there's seven or eight things when it comes to sampling. Um, you know, when you look at the book, the, the guide, it, it'll give you guides on what you should be reporting. You know, so we go back to the table. Table one will, will um, help direct you on what you need to report on. I think, you know, so it, it, it covers a lot of it. I wouldn't say it covers all of it. There's some things you'll have to know as a, say, a geologist, um, but it will will take you a long way to understanding what you need to do. Yeah. Thank Hopefully you. that answers your question. Yes, it, it does. Uh, and then the uh, second thing, um, I'm from Zimbabwe, and uh, we, we don't have our own uh, code. So, uh, is some some rec and some in a position to say maybe if a, a professional group of geologists would approach it for an assistance in developing a, a code would uh, some be in a position to assist in such I think such it, requests? I think it would um because we have done to a certain degree with china and others um what you would need to do from the zimbabwe side is uh, is write a letter to the simm manager and she would then give it to the ssc chairman um andy mcdonald and you know understanding what your requirements are so you know uh, you know, we do have a good relationship with Zimbabwe and, um, you know, I can't speak on behalf of the SSC anymore, but I think, you know, in general, in principle, I don't think, um, you know, there could be assistance. Um, we probably argue, why don't you, you know, use the SAM record. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, you know, through the SM, uh, you know, through the SIMM, you, you write to the manager and, and, and she would put it to the SSC chairman. Um, for discussion, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yes. And then uh, also uh, on the sum file. So, or what uh, qualifications qualifications would one actually need to to have to be a CV? Well, there's many, uh, you know, it's a million dollar question, uh, you know, the, you know, you got mining engineers, um, um, you, you, uh, mining engineers, you got geologists, you've got financial people. So there's a wide range of, of qualifications um, that that can do the, the work. It's really whether you're, you know, you're trained um, uh, in doing the valuations. Um, you know, first, you know, can you do financial modeling? Um, but, you know, it's one of those things, it's not the, it's not the easiest thing to learn on your own. It's, um, you know, you need to start off with as being mentored by someone, somebody in a sense. Um, so I wouldn't worry so much about my qualifications, but my ability and, you know, can I do the work? Um, do I have five, you know, you need to get five years of experience in doing valuations. Um, um, you know, if you're with a mining company, you know, being involved in that work, a lot of times, a lot of mining companies don't do valuations. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, I guess, say, getting that um, mentoring and guidance and learning, you know, learning how to do it on the job training. But in terms of, you know, if you're a geologist, a mining engineer, um, um, other other professionals have done it, chemical engineers, you know, um, so there's no, there's no, um, per se, you have to have a degree in, you know, you know, like geology, if you're doing resources, it's, you know, you don't see too many metallurgists trying to be a geologist, you know, you tend to be a geologist. Valuation, you have a bit more uh, room to play with. Okay. Okay, I think uh, that's all from from me. Okay. Thank you. If you look at the chat box, they did put um, the the manager's address is sam at simm.co.za. 
So again, you could use that. Um, and like I say, if, if, you know, for other people, if you see, you know, we need maybe more, more, de you know, discussion or uh, uh, discussions or workshops on the actual nitty gritty of SAMVAL or SAMES or something like that. Um, you can send an email to the, the manager and, you know, highlight the, the requirements you think is uh, required. Okay, cool. Any, um, I think there was a question, uh, you know, can, are, are the, will the workshops, are they are recorded and I think the idea is that they will, um, obviously we'll give you the, um, uh, the presentation and then a recording I believe is being made and will be made available. Anything else? We're at our, our knockoff time, so it's uh, 7.30. I, I thank those, you know, um, those that have attended. Um, you know, I, I guess my one comment would be it's the dinner time. So, you know, I did see that come, come 6.30, 7 o'clock, some people left to have dinner. I, I, I know the feeling. I've done it as well. Um, but those that attended, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, it's been a pleasure to to do it. Um, and I thank you for all attending. And like I say, feel free to, you know, talk to the management and say, look, if you need more things um, or any other subject matters for that matter, um, we're here to uh, provide um, guidance in that. Okay. So if that, if not, I'll um, end our, our our session or let our SIMM people. Um, send uh, end the session. If there's something pressing that you've forgotten about or tomorrow you ask, you can always send an email. I'm sure we can get back to you. All right. Thank you. All right. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, Stephen. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.